everyone. Thank you so much for the introduction. So as you said, I'm going to be talking about my study of recombination hotspots and their impact on maize genome structure. So the big concept behind this study is recombination. And the reason we want to understand recombination is because it is a limiting factor in plant breeding and understanding recombination will help us tap into genetic diversity and hopefully genetic, uh, generate favorable combinations of genes. And then hopefully with all of that, create more productive crop varieties. And the broader concept or goal behind the study is to counter threats that are associated with climate collapse. Um, because as we all probably know by now, climate change is ruining a lot of things and it's especially hurting food security in areas of availability, access, utilization, and stability of food. And one study in particular found that maize crop yield decreased by 2.6% with an average of uh, one degree Celsius increase in global average temperature. And so I wanna answer a few questions before I start talking about my actual projects. And the first one I wanna answer is what is recombination specifically? So recombination is the process by which genetic material is exchanged between chromosomes and these events that are called crossovers. And this process ensures maximum genetic diversity by incorporating genetic material from both of the parents. So you can see in the diagram over here, um, um, this could be like the maternal chromosome and this could be the paternal one. And then by the end of this process, um, both chromosomes have um, material from both of the original starting chromosomes. And the issue with this process is that the crossover frequency is relatively low across the um, chromosome and its distribution is tightly regulated. And then on top of that, the mechanism is also poorly understood. So with all these issues, plant breeding is limited by the number of crossover events. And our goal with our study is to be able to control crossover events and then disrupt this process known as linkage drag, which is a process by which um, unfavorable groups of genes per persist across generations. And so the next question I wanna answer is how crossovers occur. And for that, I have this diagram here. And um, without getting too deep into like the actual mechanism, basically what happens is a double-stranded break is formed in the beginning. And um, a few steps later, depending on the type of proteins that are involved in um, repairing this double strand break, uh, one protein in specifically that we study is MLH3, and that leads to a class one style crossover. And it could also lead to no crossover at all. And the next question, or the last question I wanna answer is what are crossover hotspots? So these are small regions on a chromosome where crossover events occur at a relatively high frequency. And so in general, crossover hotspots are unevenly distributed across the chromosome. And you can see in this diagram, you can see in this diagram in the bottom right here, it's mostly suppressed towards the center or the centromere region. And then you can see spikes towards the subtelomeric regions. And so as of right now, we don't really know what causes the hotspots to form, what maintains them, and then what also conserves them. And there's actually this paradox known as the hotspot paradox. And in this paradox, um, it was a study done a few years back where they simulated hotspots. And they found that over a few generations, um, the inactive version of the gene would cross over and then make the hotspot no. So in theory, crossbots, uh, or crossover hotspots should actually not exist. Um, but something is obviously behind the scenes that's maintaining them and causing them to reoccur. And so now to talk about my actual projects. Um, the first one I did was computational. And this was a study of crossover hotspots and haplotype boundaries. And so first of all, to answer the question, why do we wanna know where hotspots are? Um, so we wanna know where they are because right now we don't. And we wanna search for locations where they occur at a very high frequency because that um, is where a lot of recombination also occurs. And knowing where the locations are makes way for future projects where you can study why the hotspots occur in those locations and then also use that information to engineer more hotspots. And um, on top of that, expanding the crossover hotspots but distribution to suppressed regions like in the centromere would increase the um, allelic diversity that's available to plant breeders. And so to answer the question, like what are haplotypes? Um, haplotype blocks are groups of genes that are inherited together across generations. And some of their most prominent characteristics are they have a low recombination rate and they have really high LDs. So you can see in this diagram here, the darker red blocks are blocks that have high LD and these indicate that um, these are haplotypes. And so uh, the study that prefaced this one was a study of the mouse genome. And this showed that the hotspots occurred at the boundaries of two haplotype blocks. And our hypothesis was along the same lines. We believe that hotspots should occur at the haplotype block boundaries also in maize genome. And you, just to visualize this, in this picture, you can see the dark blue blocks represent um, haplotypes and then the reds are where the hotspots are. 
And so to address this question, um, we first did a pairwise sequence alignment. So for this, we originally used Minimap2, which is a program in Linux, and then um, we switched over to Anchorwave. And with this step, we produced an alignment of B73, which is the query inbred, to all 25 diverse parents. And then um, using these alignments, we visualize them using a package in R known as path R. And um, with this package, we created coverage plots of all 25 alignments and their haplotype blocks. And then the last step was to compare these alignments uh, or coverage plots to the crossover hotspot graphs. And to generate these graphs, we used a package called ggplot2, which is also in R. And we generated R plots of the average crossover hotspot distribution. And our goal in the future is to overlay these over the coverage plots to see if the hotspots align with the block boundaries. And so this was the graph that we produced from our original approach. And this was done again with Minimap2. And so this approach, um, you can see that there's kind of like really tiny haplotype blocks scattered across the chromosome. And um, that's not exactly what we were looking for. And the reason that they're so tiny is that um, this software has a lower threshold for sequence divergence. And um, that's why it gave us such tiny blocks. And the issue is that they're so small because the software is a little bit too selective for our purposes. Um, so then our next approach was to use the software known as AnchorWave. And um, this software works by aligning the anchors and then expanding outwards. And um, you can see that it was less selective and gave us these huge um, haplotype blocks. And um, the little white spaces are the breaks in the alignment. And this gave us a slightly better visualization because the software is less, less selective. Um, but as of right now, we don't really know what those breaks are and we don't think that they indicate recombination. Um, so, and then here is an example of one of the hotspot distribution plots that I made. Um, this was made again in R and you can see the Y axis is the rate and the um, X axis is the hotspot location on the chromosome. And um, you can see um, that this plot, it matches, matches up with the general distribution of hotspots that I had mentioned earlier. So you can see spikes in the subtelomeric regions and then it's mostly suppressed towards the center and then more spikes down it towards the end. So um, this shows that our computational approach did actually work. Um, so just to kind of summarize this project, um, it was a search for crossover hotspots. And I wanted to answer the question of whether they're at haplotype boundaries. And with this project, I learned how to use R and Linux for the first time. And um, some of the next steps for this project are to find a better method to identify the conserved haplotypes with the maze, such as identifying, identifying regions of high LD instead. And then I also want to be more selective with what we count as hot, hotspot crossovers. And so the next project was a more of a wet lab project. And in this project, I studied crossover hotspots on an inverted chromosome R. So what is an inverted chromosome R? Basically, here you can see in the picture, it's a mutation where a segment of a chromosome arm is completely reversed. And in our case, we reversed an entire arm. And we wanted to answer the question whether it's um, location dependent sequence dependent or methylation dependent. And our hypothesis was that the hotspot distribution would be inverted along the chromosome arm. And so for this project, um, we used a procedure known as immunofish. And the first step of this um, procedure was to collect tassels. And we collected them from a maze line that had a homozygous inversion in chromosome four. And they were collected at the pactine stage of meiosis one, and then they were fixed in solution. And then the next step was to do an amino labeling. And the purpose of this step was to be able to visualize the proteins that are involved in crossovers. So specifically, we wanted to look at the proteins called MLH3C and MLH3N. And then to visualize them, we used fluorescent antibodies. And then the last step was, um, we haven't done this yet, but our future plan is to perform FISH, which is when you fluoresce the chromosome that has the inverted arm. So that would be chromosome four. And here are two pictures. Actually, one is a GIF um, of the pictures that we collected, and these are collected in the super resolution imaging mic microscope. And um, the left you can see, it's, it's a GIF of a Z stack, which is basically when the microscope collects pictures as it moves through the layers of the myocyte. And we brighten these images during processing with ImageA. And um, one thing specifically is the blue is the chromatin. And then you can see on the right, there are some faint green dots and some red dots, which I don't know if you can really see, but um, those represent the uh, foci. And so that actually helps you tell where the proteins are on the chromatin. Oh, and then actually also I wanted to point out there's, you can see some of the arms that are coming out of the mass in the center. 
And here I have two GIFs slash videos, um, which show kind of the same thing. You can see the blue is the chromatin, and then you can see also, um, you can see the green dots in the background, um, which are the foci. Sorry. Okay, and now just to summarize this project, um, we wanted to answer the question of what happens if you invert a chromosome R and then see if crossovers, hotspots are also inverted. And um, with this project, I learned how to do immunofish, um, SIM microscopy, and also how to use image J. And then some of the next steps for this project are to actually go ahead and apply the fish to the slides that we have confirmed are in the right stage and also have proper signal. And then to also go ahead and count and analyze the foci of MLH3 on the chromosome four. And so just to kind of summarize the project in its entirety, it was a study of crossover hotspots. And to, to reemphasize this point, the reason we wanted to find hotspots is because we want to be able to hopefully induce recombination, generate genetic diversity, and then uh, create stronger plants that are also climate resilient. Uh, so that's all. Thank you so much to my mentor, Ruth, and also to my PI, Wojtek, and everybody else that's listed on the slide, and everybody in BTI. Sorry for keeping you guys for lunch. That's all. Thank you. Um, I not yet. I think that's a future goal with like studies like this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not exactly sure how big we're expecting it to be. Um, I, all I know right now is that the ones that we have are a little too big, and then the ones we've generated before were too small. Yeah. So. <laughs> I have a question. Is, is there within species variation in maize? Do like some inbred lines or whatever have higher recombination than others? Or is it, or is it like all the whole species has this? I think it does depend so on. There is genetic variation. I think so, yeah. Yeah. This, this is quite a lady has some 